Hello and welcome to day 71 of 100 Days of Tonalism. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the study I've done today is Summer Montclair by George Ines. In the last uh, couple of Nest um, posts we've done, uh, I've been reading from a book by Nikolai Tsikovsky Jr. called George Ines. It's a nice hardbound book. Uh, I really should say when it came out. I, I really don't know. Uh, if I can just look here real quickly. Uh, there's my favorite fav favorite painting, first one on the uh, on the inside. Hmm. Yeah. No indicator here. Oh yes, published 1993. Um, unfortunately, since uh, it came out in '93, not every illustration in this book is color. It's got you know about half of more color, half of more black and white, but. Uh, it's still an awesome book, and uh, you can pick it up fairly cheap on Amazon. I, I totally recommend it. Um, I'm going to pick up on page 45 here. He was talking about Ines around the uh, period of uh, 1860 after he'd uh, recently uh, come under the influence of the uh, Barbizon uh, School of Painting. And, uh, you know, I actually had been a good 10 years since that time, so. Here, uh, Anessa's emergence from obscurity, however, was not unaided or the result of artistic improvement alone. It owed more than a little to the energetic management of George Ward Nichols, who acted as his agent. Nichols studied art in Paris in the late 1850s, which must have given him common ground with Anessa. And as an art, and as the art critic of the New York Evening Post and proprietor of the Crayon Art Gallery in the early 1860s, he had positions of some influence. Nichols was only the first of several agents to whom Ines entrusted the sale of his works. It's great if he can find somebody like that, because it really takes a bit of a different temperament than that of the artist to really manage a career successfully, I think. A measure of Anessa's growing prominence and authority in the 1860s is that for the first time he attracted followers and a pupil. Mark Fisher, who later studied in France and after settling in England in 1872 was a successful painter of an Impressionist landscapes. Over the years, Anessa attracted other pu pupils, but no important ones, and I think we covered some of that ground elsewhere. In the 1860s, Ines was motivated by expressive needs that he had not felt as intensely before. His, quote, po poetic genius was tyrannized over by his moods, unquote, and he was, quote, overpowered at times by the glory and meaning of nature, unquote. Some of these came from an emotional life deepened with age, ripened by experience, and tested by adversity. Much of it comes from emotionally charged and crisis-ridden temperament of the war years, which was the Civil War time in the um, 1860s through, I think, the Civil War ended in 1865. And this was deeply aroused by the Civil War. He was never more excited than when the news of the firing reached the village. Medfield is where he lived. For he was not only a fervent American, but an abolitionist from his youth. And as his earliest critic, critics noticed an inclination to use nature rather than imitate it, but it was not until the early 1860s that he visibly confessed a theory of art in which nature was manipulated as a language to express the artist's thoughts and feelings. Or, as a writer in the New York Evening Post put it many years later, discussing a painting of 1863, quote, an impression of nature supplemented by a well-defined participris, a distinct personal note, unquote. Inessa's paintings of the 1860s did not depend for their expressiveness solely on symbolically articulate conditions of nature in, as in Lathrop put it, her solemn and majestic moods. As his contemporaries began to appreciate, their meaning came also from what Mrs. Constant termed their rendering, 
particularly from a vigorous, urgent, expressively charged handling of pigment. And this is contemptuous rejection of the trivialities of detail, and his thorough mastery of broad, large effects made it clear that he was always painting with a purpose above that of a mere picture maker. It was a rough and rugged handling, and a nervous force of execution, as contemporaries describe it, of his paintings of the 1860s, the great sprawling marks of brush every which way on the canvas, that enhance and energize symbolically legible meaning through visibly and physically apprehensible evidence of feeling. Well, I can say we're getting close to the end of the video here. Thanks for joining me for day 71. We'll see you tomorrow for day 72. Meanwhile, take good care and stay out of trouble.